Welcome back here on Jock 98.7. Uh, really honored today to have a great guest on, David Vibora, who I covered when he was a St. Louis Ram. He played in the NFL for four seasons and now has a great mission in life. But, uh, David, thanks so much for your time this morning. How are you doing? Yeah, Nate, it's great to reconnect with you amidst a quite uh, trying season, but certainly a lot of opportunity amidst a lot of difficulty and uncertainty. And, you know, for yourself, uh, being drafted as Mr. Irrelevant, final pick in the, the 2008 draft, I would imagine that in some ways your whole life has been built around adversity and overcoming adversity. Yeah, I think I've certainly taken the role of, of – uh, and, and gladly taken the role of underdog as well as a champion to those, right? So, you know, my, my whole post-football life has been about using – um, not just the gym, but mechanisms to empower people to see that, that the change that they seek is within them. And and if they can be willing to uh, intentionally go into discomfort uh, and be open, honest, and vulnerable about the things that they're facing, they can transcend them and, in fact, transform their lives, redefine their lives, and be a testament to what I think is possible for all of us in humanity. And it doesn't matter if you ever step foot on a football field. Uh, or if you're, you know, a CEO of a company, I feel we can all create a ripple effect of change and change for good that is really around using some of our perceived limitations or perceived scars as the qualifying factors, right? Like who would have expected Mr. Irrelevant to become a starter, much less have an opportunity after football to do probably the most significant things in his life. And that's the story that I've lived as a result of just owning the parts of me that I felt like were limited by my definition as a football player. And now I've seen that they've been able to be applied outside of that realm. So it's been really awesome. And, you know, there was a great article written, I was reading in the uh, Moscow Pullman Daily News, which I'm guessing is close to your hometown. You know, that's actually my college town. So I grew up okay. in Eugene, Oregon. Dad was a duck. Uh, I ended up being an Idaho Vandal. That was my only Division One offer, to your point earlier, the underdog. Um, but, yeah, that, that article was really kind of featured a lot around the growth that has happened, the, the post-football growth in my life and the impact that it's had. And, and the characteristic or, or the meaning is finding out your why post-football. And, and mm. a great story about meeting uh, U.S. Army Staff Sergeant Travis Mills, which really kind of changed the direction of your post-playing career and ultimately kind of finding your passion in life. Yeah, 100%. Staff Sergeant Travis Mills is one of five living combat injured veterans that got blown up and lost all four limbs. So he's a quadruple amputee. And he uh, walked into my gym, walked in on prosthetics. And, you know, as the story goes, it was like the hot chick in the bar. I was just magnetically drawn to him. I, I probably was rude leaving the conversation I was in to go up to this man and say, dude, you got to work out with me. Right. And he's like, bro i don't have arms and legs what do you mean work out and so the, the conversation was really um you know physical was seen through the gym eyes as market entry but really it was about dealing with what was happening between his ears right you know at some level and this is really my why and i've, I've discovered it through the work with travis and many others it's to help people close the gap between who they think they are right how they've been defined how they've been um you know, perceived in society as, hey, look, this is where this person lives in an economic kind of status, or this is what this person did based around title, giving orders, taking orders. But we can, we can go beyond that, right? And in fact, when adversity hits hardest, it's actually the, I'd say the portal or the opportunity to catapult so many things in your life. Now, it doesn't feel good <laughs> when you're in that season, but I think what Travis felt in, in getting back into the gym was this level of, wow, even though my physicality looks different, I don't have to feel or, or act broken, right? And so that's the thing is if you look somebody in their eyes and treat them like a whole person, that person shows up. And I don't care if that's a homeless person on the street, you know, if that's a, you know, a C-suite executive in a large corporation, it's really about seeing beyond the title, not seeing people as objects based around definition, but more seeing them as, as people. And amidst all of this social injustice and, and these race riots and a, that still that, that that exact principle applies. So I'm a fan of, again, being able to look at people, honor, acknowledge, but ask questions so that I can learn where their true, where they feel their true power lies, and then being able to challenge or love and encourage them in a way that hopefully helps them go beyond that and strive for something even bigger, right? And that's something that if you listen to a little Mr. Irrelevant, maybe it makes sense based around my experience, but you have to try it to believe it. 
David Vibora is our guest here on Jack 98.7. So the gym was initially just, you know, where, where athletes would go and train or just normal people. And this relationship sort of changed the way you thought about how you could train individuals post their military uh, service and get yeah. them back to being kind of just who they are as a person. One of the first things I did was take all the mirrors down in the gym. You know, we have this beautiful 19,000 square foot facility here in Carrollton, Texas, just north of Dallas. And, you know, my big kind of ethos around that was you're not there to look at yourself. You're there to work on yourself. And you won't see people with headphones in. You know, obviously, you can go to a corporate gym and people are on the cardio machines and their headphones or they're just in their own little bubble. To me, the gym is agnostic of race, gender, sexual preference, veteran, civilian, amputee, spinal cord injury, NFL, Pop Warner, right? It's this it's this melting pot of people that are coming to better themselves. And if you're present as a part of that collective group, not only are you accountable to your best in any moments, but you're also open in conversation about the things you're dealing with, right? So there may be a, a veteran that has got blown up in war, lost both legs, and driving to the gym an hour from his house, he might've gotten cut, cut off in traffic. And that triggered him in this spiral of, yeah, dealing with some post-traumatic stress, but really just heightened emotion and anger. But if he brings that in the gym, it's going to be a limiting factor. Now, some would say that anger can be fuel. It can, but to the degree that it becomes a self-defeating principle, it can, it can become the de facto um, um, kind of, I guess, limitation or, or resistance to areas of growth they wouldn't be able to see because you can only ride that so far and so long, right? It becomes exhausting. So we use those opportunities, life circumstances, and using our breath as the freaking anchor to ground ourselves in the premise, present moment, identify what is it that I'm really upset about, and then how is that going to be part of my progress, or is it part of the hindrance? And like those are just common questions that we'll ask our athletes as we're getting ready for a training session. And I just think that like the gym isn't used often enough as, as that soul mirror, right? But when a guy without legs is training you know, his butt off next to you, you're like, all right, maybe my pinky toe isn't quite as sore as I thought it was. And that perspective, it all comes back to perspective. You don't build a bridge to meet in the middle. You build it to go to the other person's side to walk around. You might not understand it. You might not like it. You probably won't. And yet it's the opportunity to create space around your own perspective and allow someone to be heard. To me, in America and the globe, we can benefit from this simple yet not so easy opportunity to grow. Well, that begs the question, what is more challenging now? I mean, is, is it, was it more challenging to, to tackle Steven Jackson or is it more <laughs> difficult to try to get these veterans to believe in themselves and really think differently about their limitations? Wow, what a question. You know, tackling guys like Steven Jackson or, or Marshawn Lynch, depending on which team I was on at the time, uh, was certainly physically more painful. <laughs> um, yet... You know, I think today I've learned a lot. You know, I've got two young girls, seven and five. We've got a little boy on the way. And I think I've, they've taught me more about how to create growth producing fear encounters, intellectual based experiences where these veterans, first responders and civilians that have endured trauma, lost limbs, spinal cord injuries, you know, been been diagnosed with Parkinson's, whatever it is. Uh, it's been a a way for them to, I think find an opportunity that they can identify with, hey, look, my pain and suffering, those are consistent with any human experience. But if I look at that as a qualifying factor for how I can pay that forward or deal hope to somebody else, suddenly now I see with x-ray vision my purpose. And so it's it's been really fun to not do it for anyone because I don't believe that's realistic or sustainable. It's about, just like a coach would, I'm going to create times in practice that stress my players to see how they respond so that, that way the game can become easier or it can flow naturally. They can be conscious uh, responders rather than unconscious reactors. Same thing is true in our gym. We want to create these opportunities for them to discover for themselves, wow, I have it in me and I have it in me for the reason of benefiting somebody else that hasn't yet discovered this. Whew, that's when you all of a sudden find people discovering their purpose and watch out. So did the Adaptive Training Foundation, uh, six years running now, um, has it appeased maybe your, I don't know if you can call it guilt, but you come from a family, three generations of Marines, correct? Yeah. So did this sort of appease maybe your need to um, continue that legacy on in some ways? 
Yeah, you know, I, I certainly have felt regret for never serving. And, I, and had I not, you know, been married and had my wife get pregnant very quickly after being married, uh, you know, it was a conversation that I often brought up to her about, you know, my willingness to sign every waiver under the sun to go and, and, and wear that patch and to serve our country. Um, but I will say with great pride um, and yet like, incredible humility, like my opportunity to do what I'm doing is my way to serve those who served us. And, you know, when President Bush came to the gym, uh, he brought Paul Ryan, Speaker Ryan, Speaker of the House at the time. And, and you know, Bush said, look, your guys' greatest opportunity to lead is actually in front of you. Thank you for what you did while wearing the uniform. But, you know, you don't have legs. Someone is going to notice the brain seeks, you know, asymmetries. And so the brain's going to recognize this person's in a wheelchair or missing legs and they're going to stare. Now, most people will look away quickly from someone in pain. But those opportunities are the small conversations when someone comes up and says, thank you for your service. What are you going to do with that? Are you going to allow that to be this kind of patronizing thing and blow them off? Oh, this person would never understand. Or are you going to give them an opportunity to which you, you look them in their eyes and, and say, hey, what I did for this country, I did for you. I don't know your name. I don't know your story, but you're worth it. And I will continue to do that for my brothers and sisters that come home um, that are dealing with identity crisis and transition. Like I didn't know, David Babor didn't know who he was without football because I had to have tunnel vision to last and to have success. But that was the debilitating moment when I, I, I coped with using opiates coming out of the league rather than uh, being willing to see where my gifts match somebody's needs in a different ecosystem. So I think that's the that's the benefit of, you know, me as somebody who founded this, being a leader that quickly knocks myself off the pedestal. If somebody puts me on a pedestal, it, it, I'm, no, I'm no special or extraordinary man. In fact, the failures in my life have been the depressivist for any of the unique impact or real meaningful conversations. So, no, I didn't get to serve. But the opportunity to, to live a life of service and servant leadership has allowed me to, again, create experiences that change beliefs, that shift behaviors, that therefore create new results, whether that's in drug addiction or post-traumatic stress or just people that are dealing with anxiety and depression and riddled with a life of uncertainty. To me, giving someone a trajectory and an aim to which they can benefit someone else, that is a hope-filled life and one that hopefully amidst times of COVID or racial, racial injustice can be a through line or, or a you know, a true north, a north star for the compass as far as what their virtue is and how they can be of benefit to the change and not be part of the problem that is the limitation of people not opening their mind. How, how quickly do you see the veterans begin to turn a page? Because even if I'm having a down day and I decide to go out for a run or something, I feel immediately 10 times better yeah. about myself. It, do you see it that quick with the veterans as well? Yeah, you know, it takes a bit. It takes what it takes. I know that's a bit of a blanket statement, but it can happen in the first couple of weeks or it can take, you know, multiple nine week courses that we run, right? And and again, all of it's cost free. And, and if anyone's, you know, inspired by what they're hearing here, I, I would encourage you to go follow Adaptive Training Foundation on Instagram or Facebook. Uh, you know, adaptivetrainingfoundation.org is the website. And I tell you that not so much for you to go and donate right now. If, if you feel compelled to do that, awesome, because all of this we provide cost-free. But I'd almost encourage you moreover to, to follow us, to share a video, to send it to someone. Everybody that's listening has been affected at some level by someone who's had a stroke, right? Or a car accident, or a, you fill in the blank, right? Like humans are not, again, uh, uh, you know, ever bulletproof, right? We are certainly ones that will endure certain types of limitations, but the transcendent opportunity for those is how you position your narrative, right? You can get a bad hand in poker, but those that really play poker well know how to play that hand. And that's the same thing that we feel is, is true about this mission. And how important too is it for them to just be around a culture of people, men and women alike, that are striving towards an end goal? Because when they originally signed up, probably to, to, to join the military in some capacity, they were part of this training regimen when they had all their limbs or they had full capacity, yep. and now they're being forced to do something again in a very uncomfortable but rewarding, uh, grueling experience. You're nailing it, man. I say this often. We, we call our organization and our group a tribe, right? And tribe is different than a team. A team is a roster based around position, roles, and responsibilities, you know, just like lar largely corporate America. But a tribe is different. It recognizes the perceivable uh, most maybe least experienced person or 
um, most in our case with the gym, most physically impaired person. Well, in our tribe, we empower them to be an integral part of the sum of the whole. So that quadriplegic that has very little dexterity and, and can barely feed himself may meet you at the door with a smile that is infectious, with an energy that feels like a church foyer after a wedding or baptism night or something. Like there's an energy to his why, his reason to show up inside of that larger why, right? Not to go to Simon Sinek and, and Golden Circle here, but to me, that is empowerment. That is great leadership. And you do that and instill that in a person and it becomes, um, you know, their rhythm or their habit. And then all of a sudden what flows out of that is an impact that I largely could never plan for. Um, there's, there's certainly a great team around me, a great a number of individuals and a huge, huge number of people that have said, hey, look, uh, this is my contribution. And it's never really about equal contribution because people have different talents and means and resources, but it is about equal sacrifice. When you, at the end of the day, like we do this big march for, for carry the load is what it's called for Memorial Day, where you know there's a whole month of these East Coast and West Coast relays that walk all the way from New York and Seattle down to Dallas. But Dallas Memorial Day weekend, we have over 30,000 people come out to walk in honor of those fallen. And, and what's so cool about that is the, it's not about everybody doing 100 miles. It's about going a little bit farther than is comfortable. And I think often that if we just live that ethos out in our everyday life, where is there a place that if I sweat, my heart rate goes up, I learn about myself, right? That sweat psychology is where I like to do life with people. It could be climbing a mountain. It could be running a race. It could be working out in the gym. But when we get to that state, when your brain tries to throttle you back, that's when you discover what's indestructible in you. And I really believe that, you know, as Americans, we need to get back to some shared suffering with great intention. And my hope is that it, that movement's already beginning to happen. And we just need to root it in great programs and opportunities to do life like what we do in the gym. David Vibora is our guest here on The Jock. Uh, do you read a lot of books? Lots of books, man. Yeah. I didn't used to. And now I read like three books a week. Wow. Isn't that something? Have you found is is there an um, author or is it mostly genre that you kind of gear towards? Yeah, it's a lot of nonfiction. It's a lot of personal development. A um, couple that come to mind: uh, Leadership and Self Deception is a profound book for anybody that's looking to really um, better their relationships. It could be in life or in business, and I would consider those just in life because <laughs> all of life is inclusive and we often draw these black and white kind of uh, pillars between my work hat and my home hat and my, but leadership and self-deception is a great book. Uh, Ego is the enemy is another one that I, I, I really love as far as um, getting outside of yourself and seeing where um, so much of that voice in your head is convincing you of, of safety and survival rather than going out and, and being a conduit for the newness of what the world has delivered you for an opportunity. Um, Eckhart Tolle is somebody in the spiritual sense. I, I certainly love, you know, David Goggins can be somebody who's a, a Navy SEAL who can rub people the wrong way, uh, a bit in your face, but Can't Hurt Me is a book that if you want to get motivated about moving your body, David Goggins are certainly bring it out of you. I'm just looking back at some of the players, your rookie year, like, I mean, these are some leaders now. O.J. Tagway, Will Witherspoon, Cora yeah. Chavis, man, Leonard Little, uh, James yeah. Laurinaitis, who would later join you, like uh, James Hall. Those are some names right there, partner. Yeah, man. I would uh, I would certainly, you know, look, Big O was on that team. We had we had uh, Torrey Holt uh, when I came in as a, as a rookie. You know, <laughs> I uh, – I, I, for me, there's so much that I sponged from those type of people. Um, you know, Leroy Glover uh, is another one that I would, I would compliment. So I, I think, you know, guys like Chris Long, and you look at the impact he's had, you know, Chris and I took a group, and we went with Keeley, uh, with Waterboys, his organization, up to do Kilimanjaro last year. And I was able to bring one of the Marines to my program six months after he was amputated above knee. Wow. It was just awesome. And, and to be able to, again, I think you mentioned, you know, you asked the question earlier about these veterans kind of finding their tribe, their community and coming all the way home. And I want to make this very clear. If, if veterans just with veterans, it's, it's a very limited diversity of thought. 
but we can bring civilians in that have never experienced what it is to take an oath, right, to an all-volunteer gun club, to go and protect our freedoms, and, and to endure, right, in the midst of, of sacrifice and teamwork and grit. Like, that is a, a lesson that is certainly taught when we mix these two ecosystems, when we bring the veterans and civilians together. Early on in my organization, people said, make it just veterans. It's sexier. You'll get more funding. And they may or may not have been right, but I was vehemently against that because I watched when that battle-hardened veteran was exchanging a number with a civilian and they were going to go hang out on the weekend. Like, I know that was no small thing. And that's what's created the uniqueness of what I call our tribe. And I think that's the, you know, you can have people of, of all different skin colors, but that largely shared the same experiences in life and they're not going to have diversity of thought. Or you can have people of all the same skin color that had wildly different experiences and they may have an immense amount of diversity of thought that can change the world. So I think we have to be careful of um, being blinded by certain times and circumstances and always looking for the broader opportunity to shut the hell up and learn from somebody that grew up in Fifth Ward in New Orleans, right? That saw that badge or that flag as, you know, uh, as a limiting in social injustice. Um, and, and so rightfully, I want to make sure that people are clear that this isn't about kneeling for the flag, right? This is about acknowledging certain privileges and being okay at the uncomfortable need to shut the hell up and listen. That's, that's where I'm just, I've been two weeks of just trying to take as many calls of people so that I can best educate myself. And that's, I think, the mark of, of where we can make progress. You know, in a lot of ways, a football locker room is probably, I mean, you talk about diversity. There, are, It's a mm -hmm. melting pot of almost every aspect of life you could imagine that just happened to be in one room, and nothing's guaranteed tomorrow in the NFL. So it's pretty cutthroat. Yeah, it's very cutthroat. And, you know, as, as, as a white dude in the NFL, like there was times where my team was like largely people of color. Right? And that was a fairly normal thing to go from like high school to college to pro. But I, that doesn't mean that I didn't have an incredible amount of privilege, right? With the resources that my family had and with the, you know, the opportunity at, you know, uh, educational tutors to make sure that this and the, it, there's just so many things that, again, like sports may have been an out for someone where for me it was a privilege to to just have to focus and worry about that and not worry about whether I had food on the table or whether we were going to be evicted. So, yeah, sh you know, shame on on me and anybody else that hasn't taken the time to acknowledge the fact that based around time uh, in history and location and geography and, you know, uh, a, a fluent opportunity. Um, yeah, I made it to the NFL, but like my duty as far as what that platform has uh, invested in me or created opportunity in me for, I have to be able to steward that in, in a positive way. And so, you know, I'm not necessarily one that wants to get into a huge conversation over social media because there is a disconnect, but in opportunities like this, I hope those listening can hear my heart. I want to be a part of the, you know, the opportunity to learn in a way that's imperfect and for people to see that I'm trying, you know, the other end of this piece is like white people aren't going to get it right. <laughs> We're certainly going to mess it up. We, we haven't got it right in a long time. So let's actually like allow ourselves a little bit of mercy and grace, but, but not let that be a limiting factor in trying, you know, just because our athletes at the gym that have endured tra trauma and injury, they're scared of falling. Travis Mills, the initial question I asked him was, what are you most afraid of? Right? No arms, no legs. He's like, dude, falling the ground, it hurts. And that was very real to him. But the truth is, it wasn't so much about falling as it was this mental construct that if he fell and couldn't get up and people didn't know how to help him, what then, right? And so identifying the thing that, look, white people, let's not be so stymied to move or to act because we're worried about getting it wrong. Let's do it in a way that owns the fact that I don't know how to do this perfectly, but I'm going to try. And my hope is that people of color acknowledge that intent and realize that like we're human, we're all human, we're going to mess this up. But like with each time that we, we have that hard conversation about what, how that person received it. Cause I think intention and the reception can be largely, there could be a huge chasm between those two. Um, and hopefully we can close that gap 
slowly and assuredly by just trying and trying again until we can make progress. Just a few more for you. Dave Vabora is our guest here on Jock 98.7. You can check out adaptivetrainingfoundation.org. Um, you know, what, what are some of the most gratifying moments that you've had to date uh, going through this new uh, career post-football? Yeah, wow, so many. Over 200 adaptive athletes, people with disabilities or experienced trauma have gone through our program, uh, flagship nine-week program where – Again, mind, body, soul, we, we, we train them in individualized workouts. We do rock climbing and pool therapy, and we do these root meetings where we lock everybody in and we talk about, you know, some of the traumas, the reason behind the reason for some of these self-defeating principles. And so I think about, um, you know, uh, Vanessa Cantu. She's a civilian who, when she was 15, endured a spinal cord injury because she was in a car accident. The bottom belt latched, the top didn't, severed her spinal cord, crushed all of her internal organs. Fast forward. 15 years, I meet her when she's 30. She has a one-year-old daughter. They said she'd never get pregnant. But when she was in a wheelchair, I looked at her and I said, hey, what's what, what's stopping you from trying to walk again? She said, well, the doctors said it wouldn't be possible. I was like, well, look, I understand that guy's in a lab coat and he did some extra schooling, but that doctor is not God. What do you say we try? Because what I watched was her daughter get up and fall, get up and fall, because she was learning to walk. She was just under one. And, and I looked at Vanessa and I said, why is your pride so big that you can't do the same? And it was this moment of like, yeah, let's do this. And so you fast forward about 18 months and she's walking unassisted, able to, and her big goal was to carry her dad, her daughter's hand as she walked her into pre-K. Huh. She was able to do that. Right. And and you can tell like there's allergies or dust that kicks up in the room when this mm-hmm. happens because my eyes start to leak. And, and those are those moments, like you can train somebody for the Paralympics and those are awesome moments, the medal, the win, but also these moments of like watching somebody get out of a wheelchair, lay flat on the ground and get back in the wheelchair with no assistance because they've never done that before. That's just as important. So it, those, you know, I could list a hundred different things. I mean, that, that Marine that I told you about climbing Kilimanjaro with, with Chris Long at the fall summit, he, he was done physically just smoked. Right. And the guy came to me and said, Hey, you know, we're going to send you back. And I walked into this Marine. And I said, the one thing that I knew I needed to say that, would get him back on track and we ended up going the next three hours he tapped that sign and we ended up getting him all the way back down so again it's it's really about defying the impossible with the identification to hey these are people that want to hold me accountable to what i say i want and can love me all the way through knowing that it's not going to be a straight path you know, the, the, the mission to the moon, they say, was only on course 3% of the time. The rest was course correction. So I, in my eyes, the purpose of life is to bounce from X to X, hopefully closing the gap between who you thought you were and who you were called to be. But doing it in community with people, that's everything. So if you don't have that, pro, that tribe and you don't have an opportunity to put something out in front of you that scares you a little bit, to me, you're not tapping into your God-given human potential. Right. Not everybody needs to go start a, you know, an orphanage in Cambodia or go climb Kilimanjaro. But we all need to decide what our Kilimanjaro is. And then along the way, do our best to look people in their eyes, treat them whole and lift them up. Because that's when you get to the top. You realize it wasn't about the destination to summit. It was that journey. It was the course correction where all of the, you know, the gold was. And, and then looking back, the summit is just the extension. Whether you touch the sign or not, it's just the extension of, what you were willing to do amidst the face that your brain told you, which was, hey, you got to stop right now to protect yourself. Dude, that is uh, beyond powerful, I mean, to tell you. Um, oh, what do you guys need? What, it, what, do, what can our listeners do or anyone that potentially might hear this interview or who you try to reach out to for Adaptive Training Found Out? What, what can we do? Yeah, certainly resources, you know, being that this is a 501c3 not-for-profit, um, you know, people need opportunities to give for some tax deference. So if that's uh, somebody that's listening and says, hey, I got, you know, 100 bucks a month and I can make that pledge, let's do it. Or maybe you just say, hey, look, I'm going to go on and, and we have these sweet T-shirts on the site. One of them is, it says, stop complaining, start adapting. <laughs> <laughs> and, and maybe you just want to buy that shirt. Um, I wore it through TSA not long ago and the TSA lady was like, hey, I need one of those. Like everybody going through TSA land is complaining. Um, so, you know, maybe you buy a t-shirt, like I said, follow social media. If you are touched by a video or a message, share it, 
there's someone in your immediate family and your immediate following that's going to be touched by it. And that's how we create that ripple effect. And hopefully inspiration, which tends to wash off semi quickly, uh, converts into aspiration and you can decide what it is in your life that you're not tapping into to be your best self or to discover your own why. David, I got two football questions for you, then you can get out of here. First of all, should Coach Hazlitt have gotten the job? I know the players advocated for him when Linehan got fired after the 08 season, but there were a lot of people who wanted Hazlitt to get that gig. Yeah, I love Haz. You know, <laughs> from a defensive-minded coach and just an old salty vet, dude, just a, just a salty dog, you know, obviously playing in Pittsburgh and – I don't think he, you know, I cracked me up anytime he tried to break a huddle because he could never really lift his arm high enough because he was in that old like three, four downhill. Like, so we'd all have to like kind of squat a bit so he didn't feel emasculated that he couldn't get his hand up. And we made sure he knew about that too, just for the record. Um, no, shout out to Haz. You know, Linehan, being an Idaho Vandal and, and appreciated so much that Linehan stuck his neck out to grab me on that last pick. Um, I wouldn't change a thing. You know, certainly have, have flirted with the idea of what if Haas was able to stick around. And, you know, I always had a great relationship, still do with Spags. I mean, I, I, I'll text him, I, you know, text him, congratulations, obviously, on winning with KC this year. We talked a couple times a year through text, and I always felt he was a, a great high character guy. But if I'm being honest about, I've learned from, you know, I had Pete Carroll in Seattle, and I had Spags in, in St. Louis. And if I look at the two, I, I He's an incredible, incredibly talented football mind, but he, as a young head coach, to me, tried to do uh, – he hired a lot of people that were yes men around him, and he tried to do everything or have a, have a pulse on everything. Where if I look at Pete Carroll, he hires really amazing assistants and trusted them and kept it super simple so that our guys could just fly and, and play fast. And so, you know, if you look at Pete Carroll's first stint in the NFL, right, he probably made that same mistake. So I, from a leadership perspective, even what I'm doing leading my team and leading these adaptive athletes, these veterans, have looked at um, it's an easy trap to try to do too much and to try to have your hand in all things. And that's where burnout lies. That's where you start to show up uh, as a forced version of yourself rather than somebody who's in the present moment treating people as people. You start to orchestrate people as, as pawns on the chessboard. And that's where I think you – it hurts culture and you, you, you get a lack of buy-in at some point, right? Obviously if you're winning, <laughs> Hey, everything's good when you're winning. So I'm very grateful for the fact that I've learned from, um, you know, coaches where we had wild success and coaches that we didn't, in fact, probably learned more in the instances of the times that we didn't have success. Um, and I still love football. I do miss Sundays, but I, I certainly feel very grateful for discovering my why and this opportunity of using the gym as a conduit to deal people hope. It's amazing work you're doing, even though it killed me when you put on that Seahawks jersey as a <laughs> Rams fan. I, You know, it just didn't sit right as an NFC West uh, rival. But you know what? I got, I'll got. i give you this much. Seattle might be one of the best venues in all of the National Football League. Their fans are tremendous. Pretty special. It was cool to play on the you know opposing team side and then go to play at Seattle. Um, being from Oregon, it was great in the Pacific Northwest. Had a lot of my family come up and and you know I, when I decided to retire, a lot of my coaches they called me and said, "Man, you got snaps left. What are you doing?" And it, if I'm honest, it didn't make sense in my head. It could have never because I felt like I was going to die on a football field. Right? You're going to have to peel me off this gridiron. Um, but where? I trusted it was something in my gut. There was this intuitive knowing that it was time. And, you know, if anybody's dealing with a, a relationship or a career change or a look at this difficult time in COVID, trust what your gut is telling you and act on it. Um, you know, really tune into that because that, that's where I think you're going to get a true north. You're going to get an opportunity. It, it, it may be scary. It may not have the financial stability that, that you'd hoped or whatnot, but just leap. You know, uh, and the rest will take care of itself because you're going to be, you know, plumb full of significance in the success and follow. Adaptive Training Foundation dot org. David Vibora, man, this has been a real treat. In fact, I just did my uh, Father's Day shopping. I got myself one, and my dad stopped complaining, started adapting T-shirts. You can find the merchandise <laughs> online. That's where you got to do it. That's right. Here we go. That's awesome. Uh, you rock, brother. Hey, I really appreciate your time. All the best with your endeavors, and uh, best health to you and your wife and your family. I know you got a, a, a your third on the way. Finally, got a boy coming. 
Yeah, that's my <laughs> that's my retirement plan. I got the man cub. He's uh he's actually measuring three weeks ahead, so maybe I got a defensive end in there. <laughs> Good deal. David, thank you for your time as always. Awesome, brother. Thanks. Take care. You too. Again, be sure to check out adaptivetrainingfoundation.org. That's David Vibora. We'll be right back on Jock 98.7 FM.